in addition, looking forward, we have a lot more stimulus coming, you know, 900 billion, the 1.9 in the winds, they're already talking about a 3 trillion. Bottom line is that when yields go lower, it's when the, the price is going up, the demand is going up. Right. And that's what happened last year. Obviously that helped, but it still had its inherent flaws, right? Gold was heavy and most, uh, and probably the biggest argument against is it's hard to settle, right? Especially when you have to settle it over space. And so that's where the layers started coming on. The actual amount of treasuries available for the public to buy that the Fed doesn't own, that's not also tucked away, it's only a few trillion. As you said, it's the hardest form of money, the best form of money. I can have it. If I have possession of it, I own it. Um, but it's very difficult. It's slow. It's hard to ship from one continent to the next, etc. If you don't own the treasuries already, you're just going to struggle to get them. So I, I'm, I'm very cautious to ever say that extra supply is causing yields to go up or that fiscal stimulus is causing yields to go up. Fiscal profligacy is causing yields to go up. I don't really buy all of those things. So we kind of had, if, if I want to recap this, so we had gold and then because gold was big and heavy and slow and hard to settle, um, we had, we put it in the bank, we got a paper gold certificate. Each layer serves a different function. The first layer is so that you don't have risk of a counterparty default. Right. The second layer is for convenience, but then you have the risk. The problem is somewhere along the line, that stack of six, seven layers was built and then whoop, gold was just taken out of the bottom. So somehow the stack still stayed, even though the whole base disappeared, right? They say that if you don't know the history, you are doomed to repeat it. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you know that I love to go back in history. I love to get historical references to show us what's happening and what that tells us about the future, not because it necessarily repeats, but it definitely does rhyme. Now, today I have a special guest, someone I'm very excited to bring back for the second time to the channel. And if you love hearing the historical references, you are going to love what Nick has to say. He's just authored a new book, called Layered Money. And it goes back through history and it goes all the way back into future tense. As a matter of fact, we start talking about the treasuries, which is something I've been talking a lot about, the US treasuries, the yield has been plummeting. And he is a professor at USC. He talks about this to his students and he knows what's going on. And he's got a different take than what I've been saying. And it's one that you wanna hear. Then we go back into history to learn about what happened that's actually sparked the Renaissance. And then of course we bring it all the way back to current date. This is an interview you do not want to miss. It was one that I really enjoyed. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Market Disruptor Show. Today, I am so excited to bring back for a second time, I think maybe only the second guest that's been back a second time. Uh, Nick is back with us. He is the author of the brand new book, Layered Money, which we'll be talking about. He's also an adjunct professor at the USC Marshall School of Business. And uh, Nick, it's just a, just an honor to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Great to be back, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you are an adjunct professor. Um, you had a career in finance. Um, I know you've worked with treasuries. I want to talk about, of course, you have this new book that's amazing that I've been loving. Um, and I want to talk about that, but maybe just real quick, give us a little bit of background on, uh, kind of your work in, in big finance before, and then kind of like what, where, where you're at right now. Sure. So I started in the fixed income industry, uh, several years ago, and I was working at a couple different bond managers. And then the most recent job that I had was uh, trading U.S. Treasuries on a trading desk for a large uh, institutional investment manager and also helping on the interest rate strategy team. So global macro economics and uh, trading U.S. government securities and other interest rate derivatives. I was, I was doing that for several years and I really enjoyed being on the desk. Uh, that was something that Hey, just a real quick interruption to let you know that this video is brought to you ad free by BlockFi. Now they're giving you the ability to hodl your Bitcoin and your crypto as it goes up in value. And at the same time, you can earn high yielding interest on it. So you can basically hold it for all the upside potential, and then you can make cash flow off of it at the exact same time. Now opening an account super fast, <clears throat> super simple, and they've offered to give me up to $250 for every sign up, But I told them, you know what, let's give it back to you. So you can now go and you can get the $250 whenever you set up your account. And all you have to do is just check the link in the description for details, set up an account, super quick and easy, and earn up to $250 brought to you by BlockFi. So check them out. I learned so much from, and I got to study the Fed really uh, intimately on a daily basis, 
read research from some of the greatest thinkers uh, on Wall Street with regard to treasuries and interest rates and um, the, the way that the economy is going and especially how the financial system works. So but when I was there on the desk, I also started to fall down the Bitcoin rabbit hole at the same time. And uh, as time progressed, I started to read more and more about Bitcoin. And then I started to write more about Bitcoin, started publishing some uh, research pieces about Bitcoin and Lightning Network. And that really, um, it really put, pulled me in this, in this direction of becoming a writer about Bitcoin. And then uh, I left the bond market in late 2019 and in 2020 spent the whole year uh, writing layered money. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, it's kind of an interesting track that brought you to kind of where you are today. It seems like, and maybe I'm wrong, but it almost seems like maybe the more into the traditional financial system people are, sometimes the harder it may be for them to see um, the, the other way that it could be, right? Almost like, uh, what is it? See the forest through the trees or whatever it is. Um, but let's dig into that for a minute. So you were working at a desk trading treasuries. So I want to talk about that for a minute because uh, I've been talking about that quite a bit on my channel. And so obviously treasuries are a risk-free asset or whatever they call that. Um, but lately they've been moving quite a bit. What have you been seeing in the treasury market? Let's just talk about that for a minute. Are you still yeah, following that? Yes, I am. Uh, and, you know, I talk about the market with my students uh, at USC. Uh, I teach a fixed income course over there. So we talk about interest rates all the time. And, you know, one of the questions right now is why are interest rates moving so much? Uh, and they've seemed to move uh, quite a bit higher in the last several months. Right. What I always like to do is zoom out, take a moment, zoom out. Let's look at the trend. Let's look at where we are. I'm a, I'm a chartist. I'm a technical analyst uh, as well. And so I always like to look at price behavior through the lens of the chart and what what is the what are the buyers and sellers doing and how is that reflected uh, pictorially in in an image for us. So when I show them the 40 year chart, I see a down channel in interest rates. That channel has not been broken by any stretch of the imagination. We are still in this multi decade downward trend in interest rates now. On top of that, we had an extremely dramatic move lower in interest rates in February, March of last year. And on, you know, through the summer, as rates went to zero, uh, almost across the, the whole curve. So when you get a move like that, and you get a 50% retracement, for example, that is in context of uh, a normal move. Okay. And so right now, I would characterize uh, the, the vast majority of this retracement higher in interest rates in the United States as a, a natural retracement of a very dramatic move last year. As last year, the market starts pricing in total calamity and economic collapse. And then we realize that people are not deathly afraid to go outside of their homes and they're still spending money and so the economy recovers and uh, interest rates rise back up to levels where, you know, they were uh, around the beginning of the pandemic. And I don't, uh, I, you know, we're not even there yet. It hasn't retraced all of that move. So, you know, that's one side of the story is that this could just be, you know, things starting to get back to normal. The other side of the story is that, yes, there is more growth worldwide in the economy in the last three to six months than there was before that. And rates always price in this rate of change and momentum and how things are going at the margin. Well, right now, things at the margin are going better. So sell the risk-free asset, treasuries, that decreases the price, raises the interest rate. So treasury rates right now headed higher. Um, if they start going above 2%, above 2.5% in the 10-year part of the curve, then we can like start waving some flags and say, hey, what is happening longer term here with United States treasuries? But I think it's far too, far too premature to make any grand conclusions about treasuries as the risk-free asset right now. Um, I do personally anticipate uh, treasuries to reach a, a yield level somewhere between here and 2%, meaning you know one and a half to 2% on 10-year yields. 
that actually starts to slow down uh, the economy. And how does that happen? Higher interest rates are a tighter financial condition. If you have cash in the bank and you're looking at treasuries at 0.5%, you, you say, I'd rather invest that money somewhere else. But if you see treasuries at 2%, uh, you can lock that in for 10 years. Uh, investors are going to sell their risk assets, purchase treasuries, and drive down interest rates. And higher interest rates themselves carry more interest cost for companies when they're borrowing. So higher interest rates are a natural uh, um, tightening of financial conditions. They do make things a little bit more difficult. And I think we're probably at that level in interest rates sometime soon that they will start to reverse. And I do anticipate that rates will stay low for a long, long time uh, here in the United States. Yeah. So, I mean, we saw them sell off down to about, you know, 50, about 0.5, right? And then I think uh, since that was August of last year, they've almost gone up 150% back to the you know, buck 50 range, as you said. Um, and, and you think they were just oversold or over, oversold and now they're just kind of um, reverting to the mean almost, if you will. Yeah, um, you know, that's a good way. And it's always confusing when you talk about treasuries because you can say that the prices are rallying and or selling off or the yields are rallying or selling off. But yeah, the bottom line is that when yields go lower, it's when the, the price is going up, the demand is going up. Right. And that's what happened last year. And, and so, yes, I do feel that people are selling their risk-free asset right now and reinvesting that in other places as uh, it's cl it's clear to us that um, you know the economy is is surviving this pandemic. It is growing out of it, and um, that people are you know starting to travel around the world again. But what about when you look a little bit deeper under the hood, right? And you look at like who's buying the treasury. So um, right, it looks like maybe we have kind of a lack of foreign buyers. Maybe more buying from the Fed. In addition, looking forward, we have a lot more stimulus coming, you know, 900 billion, the 1.9 in the winds, they're already talking about a 3 trillion. And based off of uh, the Biden administration and the new Green New Deal, whatever, like, I mean, we could be, who knows, five, six, 10 trillion. Do you think that has anything to play into those those yields on the treasuries as well? Um, one, the, the increase of stimulus and two, maybe is there a lack of buyers and the Fed has to start kind of controlling that a little? You know, it, it, there, there are always these couple things that are blamed when treasury, go, treasury rates go higher. One is that the treasury is issuing a lot. So there's just a ton of extra supply. So right. where's the, you know, the incremental buyer? And the other is that, oh, there's going to be fiscal stimulus that's going to create aggregate demand in the economy that's going to trigger inflation. And then, you know, interest rates go up as a natural kind of uh, result from inflationary environment. Um, but I challenge, I always challenge these things because now we have this, um, this additional uh, buyer of the Fed, which you mentioned. So it's a little bit nuanced, but really what you have to think about, there's 30 trillion treasuries existing, right? The Fed now owns seven plus approximately of them. So call it a quarter of the market. If things go badly in the world, the actual amount of treasuries available for the public to buy that the Fed doesn't own, that's not also tucked away, it's only a few trillion. And so you have, you know, 100 plus trillion of assets that are trying to jam into only a couple trillion of treasuries. And that's what makes this price go up and the yields go down when, when shit hits the fan, right? When things go badly in the economy, it's the flight to safety. When we're in this, um, we're, we're in the opposite environment right now where there's no flight to safety. There's actually, um, you're leaving the safety to go invest in other, way, in other ways. Then there, you know, there's maybe this worry, like where's the buyer? The foreign you know, demand has gone down and we can see that maybe in the statistics a little bit. The domestic buyer or the investment managers themselves, they're not lining up to buy because you know, things are going well and they want to put that money to work elsewhere and get some credit spread on top of what treasuries yield. But then when rates go up and things actually start to go bad in the economy, it's a, it's a reflexivity sort of situation where the higher rates actually cause things to break 
and that causes people to go into the safety, the Fed then also then threatens to buy more treasuries and actually remove the supply of risk-free assets to the rest of the world. Right. And so there's always this Fed being an infinite buyer in the back of people's minds. And it makes them the marginal supply available to the market in crisis incredibly small. And yeah. so if you don't already own the treasuries as part of your portfolio, you're going to be chasing a price higher and a yield lower as you try to lock in these yields for the next 10 years and survive any you know, financial collapse that you know, might be happening over the next couple of years. If you don't own the treasuries already, you're just going to struggle to get them. So I, I'm, I'm very cautious to ever say that extra supply is causing yields to go up or that fiscal stimulus is causing yields to go up. Fiscal profligacy is causing yields to go up. I don't really buy all of those things unless we do end this bull market in bonds, unless yields go to three, if, if treasury yields go to 3% in the next three months, Mark, I'm definitely wrong. We can have another chat and I'll have to change my investment thesis, but not here at one and a half percent, definitely yeah. not at 1.99%. Got it. Uh, so last question about that. And then I want to move on and, and talk about how we tie this into the whole layered stack that, that you, that your thesis is on. But um, one more question about that. So just as you said, if it went to two, two and a half, you wouldn't be so worried at three, you would be willing to rewrite that. Um, at what point does the Fed get, I mean, obviously they've talked about not raising rates. They've talked about, you know, potentially controlling the yield curve, et cetera. I mean, do you think they let it get up to almost three before they really come in hot and really try to control that? Or two and a half is where they're starting to kind of pay attention? Uh, especially think, considering the deficits that we're running right now? Yes, especially because the deficits that we are running right now. And that uh, that's really the core of it, right? It's a mathematical uh, restriction. You have a huge stock of debt. If you have to roll over that debt at 3%, all of a sudden, you're taking huge, huge uh, revenue, or I'm sorry, you're taking a huge chunk of money from the treasury going to interest, you know, the interest holders, including the Fed who own, you know, owns, owns all of this treasury debt. Of course, they remit any profits they make uh, back to the treasury, but they're paying all these coupons and they're not gonna be able to afford other things. And that is uh, limiting to economic activity. Then it actually gets into the employment picture when the Fed is looking at it. And so there is definitely a level, it's hard for me to say, what it is, but there's a level close to here, two, two and a half, three percent, somewhere in that range, where the Fed starts to worry and says, we might have to, you know, start buying more treasuries on top of what they're right. already doing. Got it. So um, I, that, that was great. Thanks for doing that. And, and now I want to transition us, uh, for everybody listening, I want to transition us into uh, my favorite subject. If you watch the channel, I always try to bring this historical reference in. And so Nick's written this great book. It's called Layered Money. If you like my videos where I bring historical references forward, then you're going to love his book, Layered Money. Um, but I want to tie, we'll tie treasuries back in because it's part of the stack. But let's go ahead and just start um, back into that book and go back to history. You and I were talking uh, off camera um, or before we start recording and uh, talking about how there was this, um, this, this renaissance that was created because the whole world had got onto like a standard uh, unit of money and then things started evolving from there. So maybe take us back to that point and kind of give us that, that frame of reference. During the renaissance, the Florentine Mint issued a coin in the year 1252 called the Gold Florin and that gold florin had an unchanged purity and weight for over 300 years. And that was this remarkable advance in uh, currency denomination stability. And because I guess what, what, what were they doing before that? What, I mean, why was it so unstable? Yeah, of course. Uh, it, was so, um, it was so revolutionary what the Florentine Mint did because before that, government after government, monarchy after monarchy devalued their coins over time, they would have less gold content or silver content in the coins that they would mint throughout time. So the coin from the year 500 and the coin from the year 550 AD um, were different from each other, even though they were called the same thing by the government. And that creates confusion and it creates um, 
Hey, just another quick interruption to let you know that this video is brought to you ad free by BlockFi. Now, they allow you to hold onto your Bitcoin and your other cryptos for all the potential upside. And at the same time, you can earn high yielding interest on it. So it basically cash flows. Now, with BlockFi, you can earn up to 8.6% interest. You can also borrow against your crypto as well. It's super fast, it's super easy to set up an account. And right now, you can get up to $250 when you set up your account. Check the link in the description that I have for details in order to claim that $250 because BlockFi is the future of finance. Just check the link in the description for all the details of how to claim your $250 today. Obviously it creates inflation. It, it is, it is um, technically a devaluation of your currency. Um, you know, by definition. And so that was the trend before and it, guess what? It's still the trend after. So right. what, what the Florentine Mint did during that time was very remarkable and gave this base for uh, things to flourish on top of it. And of course the Florin as a coin ceased to exist just like every other one. But the fact that it lasted for so long during a time, just like you were mentioning before we got on camera, during a time of a renaissance in so many other things, science, mathematics, architecture, art, innovation, business structure, maritime insurance. I mean, you're talking about uh, so many uh, different advances as a human civilization during this time. It really um, set forth this system, uh, a monetary system that could be built on top of the foreign at the time. Yeah. So do you think, um, I guess, going back to this, to the history and we did talk about it, but I don't know, I didn't go back and study it as well as you did, but I've, I've always kind of thought that maybe it was going to that standard unit of account that allowed for free trade to start flourishing because now everybody could trade from country to country. Everybody knew what that money was worth, which then allowed people to specialize. And then we had this explosion of, of the Renaissance, right? Like, as you said, the science and the arts and things, but um, were those two correlated or do you think it started before? Did the money help that? It's hard to know. What, okay. what I concluded in the book is that during the time, this idea of an international economy, uh, let's call it in the 13th century, the 14th century, the international economy was this series of traveling fairs between merchants. So imagine, you know, like a cloth trader and a spices trader, um, you know, and all these different traders coming together uh, across the European continent. So Spain, France, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, they were traveling all over. And when they met once a quarter, every three, six months, they would trade. And so what started happening at these fairs? Bankers started following them and bridging debts between merchants for three to six months. And when they bridge debts, they are issuing these promises. They're issuing credit form, you know, credit instruments, forms of money. And when you can say, oh, uh, I want to borrow a little money, buy my textiles, uh, make my finished product, and then sell the clothes. And I finance that activity with a banker, that's going to cause the economy to grow because that I now am adding value to the economy that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not had access to credit because I don't have the money to buy all that, all that cloth or that raw material to make clothes with. So yes, bankers issuing credit stimulated the economy during that time. And as the bankers traveled with the merchants from fair to fair across the European continent, uh, the fairs started to become more important because not only could you trade, but you could also finance your business at the fairs. Got it. So, and remember that had nothing to do with the florin. That was just bankers forming a network with each other. Now, if the florin was part of transactions during that time, that has a compounding effect on this idea of an international economy where several, uh, you know, people throughout several parts of the world are all denominating their balance sheets in florin. So not only are you doing, you know, great trade between 
different commodities or finished products, but now you are thinking about um, moving capital around uh, more dynamically using this network of bankers and a shared denomination. But you know, we shouldn't uh, confuse it and say that Florin was everybody's denomination. It was one coin. It was the most popular coin. It was an incredibly durable coin, but that the Florin alone didn't create this uh, great system, monetary system with a, a banking network. Sure, sure. But um, because they did have that standard unit account and they did have a more stable system, maybe, maybe it added to it. But so obviously that helped, but it still had its inherent flaws, right? Gold was heavy and most, uh, and probably the biggest argument against is it's hard to settle, right? Especially when you have to settle it over space. And so that's where the layers started coming on. That's um, right. Maybe and give so, us a kind of high level view of how those layers work. And then I think if people can understand that, they can understand kind of a better understanding of what we're looking at today. Definitely. Go, the, the idea of layered money is, is this idea that money has an inherent hierarchy to it. You think about different types of money today, your checking account, the cash in your wallet, your Venmo balance. These are actually... Um, People think of them as all forms of money, but they actually fall into a hierarchy. The cash in your wallet is issued by the Fed, and it's a higher form of money than your checking account dollars because that's issued by a private bank. And the Venmo balance is issued by a company that uses your banking balance. So they're not actually all equal. Not all forms of money are equal. They fall into a hierarchy, right. and the hierarchy is determined by really whose balance sheet the money comes from. And so what I tried to do with layered money is eliminate this idea of balance sheets and assets and liabilities, and just thinking of it as a first, second, and third layer of money. The first layer being uh, the highest form of money, and then on down we go. So in a historical context, a gold coin is a first layer money. It doesn't have a counterparty. It isn't issued by uh, a bank. It is a physical item that you can hold in your pocket. Right. A gold certificate that says, I promise to pay the bearer one gold coin on demand is a second layer money because it promises to pay a first layer money and it's issued by a financial institution or a banker. So this relationship between first layer money and second layer money is this natural hierarchy of money. And our whole financial system works with a hierarchy. And I have these illustrations throughout the book where I show the first example of gold and gold certificates, but then we get into what does it look like today with the Fed? And you can see that it's a highly complex system, but it yeah. still is built like a hierarchy. So um, to kind of break this down a little bit, um, so we have basically gold, which is, as you said, it's the hardest form of money, the best form of money, I can have it. If I have possession of it, I own it. Um, but it's very difficult. It's slow. It's hard to ship from one continent to the next, et cetera. Hard to break down denominations, all these things. So then we deposit that into a, into a bank and they give me paper gold certificates. That's the second layer. And those are much easier to transport around. I can carry paper in my pocket. It's easier to send to you, et cetera. And so really each layer gives you maybe an, an extra layer of convenience um, so it does something different. It has an extra feature, but at the end of the day, like I could end up holding a piece of paper that I may not be able to redeem for the gold. And that's absolutely right. That's the trade-off between the layers of money. Each layer serves a different function. The first layer is so that you don't have risk of a counterparty default. Right. The second layer is for convenience, but then you have the risk, right? Exactly what you said. The paper can be worthless tomorrow. And so we do, but... But listen, we do make that trade-off in the past and today and in the future, we all make that trade-off. And so, um, you know, that's really what the layers represent. They, they represent this idea that we can have a, we can have choice between how much counterparty exposure or how much risk that we are willing to carry with us on, on, on any given day. And just to fast forward to Bitcoin, because that's the thesis of the book, Bitcoin empowers people to have directly to have access to the first layer of money, a counterparty free asset that they can hold themselves 
No bank can default to them. I'm not talking about Bitcoin on an exchange. That's a second layer Bitcoin right. still. It's a promise to pay Bitcoin. You can withdraw it if the exchange honors your request. Right. And listen, people still have Bitcoin on exchanges and Bitcoin in their own uh, private key storage mechanism, whatever they choose to do. So even the, even the people that are, let's call them the staunchest hodlers, the people who say, own your keys, not your keys, not your coins, the moment they put Bitcoin on an exchange, they have both first and second layer Bitcoin. They have their own Bitcoin, then they have Bitcoin balances. Why do they do that? Because the Bitcoin balances are going to give them quicker access to USD, potentially. That's why they did it in right. the first place. And so that trade-off happens. It exists. It, and we can see that, you know, looking back, uh, you know, a thousand years. And I try to do that in the book. Yeah. So we kind of had, if, if I want to recap this, so we had gold and then because gold was big and heavy and slow and hard to settle, um, we had, we put it in the bank, we got a paper gold certificate and then um, maybe we advanced and we got like checks and then we got checks and then checks were too slow. So then we got like credit cards and then credit cards were, were not, a, not everybody can take a credit card. So then we got like, so, so it's like gold and then paper gold certificates and then checks and then uh, credit debit cards. And then um, that still didn't work. So then we have like PayPal or Venmo. And that's like a sixth or seventh layer, right? All built on that stack. The problem is somewhere along the line, that stack of six, seven layers was built. And then whoop, gold was just taken out of the bottom. So somehow the stack still stayed, even though the whole base disappeared, right? That's right. And um, this is this idea of fiat currency. Right. And, um, you know, readers will notice I try to avoid the words inflation, deflation, and fiat entirely in the book. Actually, the only time the word fiat ap appears is when Satoshi talks about fiat currency. It's a great quote um, from early on in the Bitcoin network. But fiat just means that um, the base is not there, right? The, the anchor of the system is not there. It's now by decree. It's a trust in the currency. Um, but if you look at the layered system, it's not that the, the first layer of money isn't there anymore. It's what is the, what is the fed own? They own U S treasuries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to pull it full circle, U S treasuries are now the first layer of money because it's what the fed owns. It's what backs the dollar, um, that the fed issues. It's what backs the federal reserve reserve balances that they issue to the banks which issue deposits to you and I uh, that you know circulate as currency um, in the economy. So U.S. Treasuries uh, today are the first layer of money. Gold doesn't exist within the dollar pyramid anymore. Right. It was removed, um, but that doesn't. Again, the U.S. dollar is still the world reserve currency. So just because it doesn't have gold as part of it. Uh, doesn't mean that it can't function, is it? Now, people don't trust it as much and are losing trust with the Fed doing what they're doing over the last uh, you know, decade plus. Um, and that's why it's part of why we see the price of gold higher today than it was 10 years ago. It's also why we see um, Bitcoin emerging as you know, a direct response to this idea that um, fiat currency doesn't have an anchor. It is simply by decree. And uh, I do believe that Satoshi attempt to address that with Bitcoin. Yeah. So moving on to Bitcoin. So uh, a lot of people that um, believe in Bitcoin believe that Bitcoin could be gold and not just a lot of people that believe in it. I mean, we've seen JP Morgan come out our Citibank and put out guidance and say it's going to beat gold. I mean, they say it's a better form of gold. So a lot of people think they equate it to that digital gold. But then a lot of people that are against Bitcoin or think Bitcoin has these flaws would say that, well, Bitcoin's too slow. It's not as fast as Visa or MasterCard. And I think that's where your thesis picks back up on it. Is that right? Do you want to fill us in on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you, if you're done reading my book and you still make this comparison to Visa and MasterCard, then you didn't comprehend. Uh, no, this is to book. get people to read the book, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and, and you're absolutely right. That's what I tried to do is I, 
I try to show that it's just like you're talking about the sixth or the seventh layer of money, Venmo and PayPal. Uh, it's not the same thing as Bitcoin at all. Bitcoin is its own new virtual numerical commodity. It's not, it's not a payment network first. It happens to have this uh, transaction mechanism that people can transact and that happens to be a little slow, but the Fed wire went down today. And so, and it's a, it's a weekday, it's the middle of the week and it was the middle of the day. So the first layer of money uh, in the dollar system doesn't move very quickly either. And so um, the Lightning Network enables Bitcoin to be transacted instantly. You can have full counterparty money. So like if you know people wanted to have exchange balances sending to each other, not using Bitcoin, they can do that today also um, instantly. And so if you want to instantly transact Bitcoin, just use a different layer of Bitcoin. If you want to final settle Bitcoin, you're going to have to wait 10 minutes. And if you don't want to, then you can go find yourself another uh, version of money. Yeah, great. All right, Nick, thanks so much for giving us that overview of layered money. And for anybody who wants that historical reference, like I talk about all the time, definitely go read it. And then anybody who thinks that Bitcoin can't solve this problem, go back and read it as well. Um, I'm going to put links to it down below for anybody that wants to follow Nick, wants to get more of his writing and, of course, buy the book. So I'll set it down there. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Uh, everybody go check out Layered Money. And uh, thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks so much, Nick. Nick.